106. And we have some people here with us. We have Vic Dwyer, we have Lee Rosberg, we have Britt Hazelton and Paul Simonera listening in. Welcome, welcome one and all. Any amendments to the agenda, Sarah? I think Liz said she would like to discuss the results of the planning commission, the, the planning survey that she yep. said under yep. other business. Okay, got it. Um, so we'll do that under uh, under other business. That's okay with you, Liz. Does that work? Yes, yeah, fine. Okay. So the first item on the agenda is considering the Middlesex Conservation Commission's recommendation that 5,000 be allocated from the conservation fund to assist in the Vermont Land Trust purchase of the development rights on 88 acres of Peace Farm on Culver Hill action likely. So Lee, is this you? You're gonna tell us about this? Yeah, this Again? is me. And we, yeah, we talked about it um, last month, uh, the Vermont Land Trust and uh, the Conservation Commission supports the Vermont Land Trust application for $5,000. Um, towards the purchase of the development rights of the Seedman Harrower property, which is 88 acres um, on Culver Hill Road. The farm's being purchased by um, a woman who has experience operating a vegetable farm and she intends to keep um, the property in ag agricultural use as a vegetable farm, um, hosting community events. And as we discussed last time, there's um, no formal agreement in the application, but a seeming willingness to work with, with the town to um, have some s sort of public access to trails if, if that's something the town wants to pursue. And Britt Hazelton here, he's um, from the Vermont Land Trust and was the applicant. I don't know, Britt, if you wanna add anything. Yeah, no, that's great, Lee. Uh, thank you. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, so at this point, we've been working on this project for, for quite a while. We do have a grant application that's been approved by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for the vast majority of the funds needed for this project. Um, VHCB, they use state and federal money towards their farmland conservation program. And one of their policies is to ask us and other grantees, you know, applying for VHCB funds to look for, seek out local uh, funding leverage whenever possible. So in a community like Middlesex with a town conservation fund, it's part of the process to, you know, put in a uh, a request for funds if there are funds available. So that's what brings us here. So Lee, remind us what the balance is in the conservation fund. It's just about a little over 5,000. No, it's currently over 9,000. Oh, okay. Thank you. I know you told us that the last time and I, and I'd forgotten. Um, no problem. And Dorinda, does that include the 5,000 for this year or not? Probably not. No, nothing's going in for this year yet. Right, so we owe you or we owe the fund another $5,000 for this year. Are you certain uh, about that? I, I thought the 9,000 included what was appropriated at the last town meeting and that, that's yeah, what our- that's that's budget what our, uh, just barely, That budget just barely started and none of the funds have been moved over yet. Okay. So maybe you're calculating it in your figures, but we haven't physically moved the funds. So I think that 9,000, as Dorinda just pointed out, it calculates that $5,000, but it's not actually there. I just okay. learned. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I just wanted to make clear what we, where we, uh, where we stand. Yep. Yeah. And think, and that, you know, one thing to add on to my thoughts before, um, you know, I, we totally recognize that this is a pretty substantial request in terms of the, you know, balance of the conservation fund, whether this year's allocation is included in that 9,000 or not, it's still a significant chunk. Um, so, you know, we, we go into that, uh, we go into this request knowing that it's a, it's a big ask. Um, yeah, thank you. 
the, you know, that when we get communities to help support these projects, um, we're always working with communities in terms of making sure that our conservation efforts are aligned with town planning and zoning. Um, and sometimes if there are potential conflicts, we go through a, you know, very robust process of getting select board and planning commission approval. Um, you know, if there's zoning issues or things that may not seem compatible with conservation. Um, but it really is um, tremendously important to VLT and VHCB to get local leverage like this. Um, you know, there's substantial funds uh, available through the state and federal funding typically. Um, you know, we have a few or million bucks every year that we can spend on these conservation projects. But that money is pretty limited, actually, when you are thinking about conserving farmland statewide. Um, and so whenever we can get uh, local leverage or get private fundraising in some circumstances, we're not doing that here. Um, it really does add up to um, help VHCB leverage its limited dollars. Yeah. Are there any, uh, any other partners involved in this project or is it just uh, you and us, as I say? Uh, just us, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so the the VHCB allocation again that that's uh, about half state funds from the state budget, um, and then it's about half federal funding through USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is federal farm bill funding um, okay. that Vermont has uh, become very successful at at getting. <laughs> Um, thanks to the VHCB uh, funding that's made available each year. Okay. Any other questions, board members? Questions? Yes, I, I, I have one question. If that $5,000, uh, so just say that $5,000 wasn't put in there, that means the project still goes, but uh, Seedman gets 5,000 less. Is, am I correct with that? Yeah, I mean, as, you know, we have a contract with Sarah and Scott to purchase the easement at the full appraised value. Um, so if we, right now we have all the funding except for $5,000. <laughs> so they could decide not to move forward if they don't get the full purchase price, or they could just decide to accept, you know, 5,000 bucks less. Than they being uh, Sarah and Scott Perrard? Yep. I have a question because I, because I know that the funds are limited. Um, what was it about that property that because I live right near this property and I use that I walk in their fields and it's beautiful land, but yeah. in the grand scheme of things, it, it's not it doesn't border other land trust land. Maybe there's one piece that does, but you know borders private property. They've kept quite a bit of the land of that they own um, to themselves. Um, so I don't see it so much as like a, a value to the community, except for that it's a beautiful piece of property and it's nice to drive by and not see development and see farmland. Um, so is that, was it specifically for this sort of agricultural use that, because I, I truly don't see a huge benefit to the town in terms of the use of that property, um, especially if the woman ends up using those fields for farming. Um, so I just am curious as to how they chose that one over maybe some other ones. Yeah, well, so we, we do farm projects all over the state and there's other, you know, Upper Valley Land Trust is another land trust that does work in Vermont and they go for VHCB farmland funding as well. But VHCB, uh, it is a competitive process to get through that funding program. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of variables that go into like which projects, which properties we will select to bring through that process. And in this case, um, you know, there are a few intriguing things about it. The proximity to Montpelier, um, the fact that there aren't a lot of farms in Middlesex. Um, and so there's an opportunity to, to help conserve a farm and start a new farm business in a town that frankly just doesn't have a lot of that <laughs> right now. Um, and yeah, th there's actually been a demand. So Vermont Land Trust, we run this farmland access program, um, which has a goal to uh, help uh, new and beginning farmers access farms because farmland 
access, you know, being able to affordably buy a property. Um, that's a huge barrier for young farmers or older farmers who are just getting into it. Um, so when land conservation happens, it helps make farms more affordable for those farmers. And in this particular case, um, this type of property is, it's not a conventional farm in the context of like our whole portfolio of farms that we've conserved over the years. If you look at our work, there's a lot of dairy farms conserved in Addison County, Franklin County, Orleans County. Um, and this is a hill farm in Middlesex. It is quite a bit different. Um, but we've, seen a lot of, we've had a lot of interest in our in the whole pool of farm seeders yeah. who are looking to buy their first farm. And this type of property is really well suited to a diversified vegetable, vegetable operation like Nicole is hoping to start there. Um, it's got good access to markets in Montpelier. Um, it's a beautiful spot to hold you know, farm dinners and other on-farm events. Um, they don't need a hundred acres of tillable land, you know, like a, a larger dairy farm might need. There's a there's a lot of very productive ag soils there for a veg, vegetable operation like hers. So we see farms like this as a very important mix in kind of the overall farm portfolio in Vermont, if you could call it that. So that might be a long-winded rambling answer to your question. I don't know if it was exactly getting at your point. No, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Is there any, um, I'm just curious, is, are, is the land trust ever looking at the property that's adjacent to it behind it, the Appel property that's like 700 acres that's been for sale for a long time and they keep lowering the price? Oh, I am not familiar with that. Is that a woodland property? All woodland, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm not familiar with that one. I mean, we always operate um, based on, you know, willing landowners coming to us. <laughs> Um, and who are looking to learn more about conservation options. And that's how Sarah and Scott came to us. They are ready to retire, you know, wanted to find a farmer to take over their farm and wanted it to be affordable for them. So that's where we came in. Um, that one, that neighboring property may have come to us. The funding, frankly, for conservation of those types of parcels is a lot harder to come by than the farmland funding. We're very lucky with our state delegation to Washington um, and with the way the farm bill is structured to have that federal money and a commitment each year from the state to, to match that federal farm money. Um, the woodland properties, it's it's a little harder these days to get conservation funding yeah. for those. Thank you. Yeah. I'd just add that um, the, the Conservation Commission was attracted to this project because it has a different flavor than um, recent and other uses of the conservation fund, which focused on uh, woodland conservation and, and preservation of recreational access or developing recreational access. Um, and and between, between the town forest, the expansion of the town forest, development of the trail there, um, supporting the Hunger Mountain Headwaters project um, to preserve access to the Hunger Mountain Trailhead. We feel like we've done quite a bit in that arena over the last few years. And um, like Britt pointed out, there frankly isn't a lot of um, agricultural land in Middlesex. Uh, this is a pretty unique property and um, we, we like the idea of, of preserving the agricultural land. Sarah, I don't know if you noticed, but Peter's got somehow got disconnected. I noticed Peter wasn't there and I kept looking for him and I thought maybe he'd just taken his picture off. No, I don't, know, I don't know what happened. He hasn't tried to come back in either. So mm -hmm. um, while he does, can I just ask a question for the minutes? Uh, you said that the the state and federal funds are going to purchase the, these are 88 acres, correct? Uh, the conservation easement on 88 acres, yeah. Okay, and you said you paid the full price, you're going to pay the full price for that? I just need to put in the minutes how much is money is going to be purchased that with federal and state tax dollars. Uh, yeah, so let me just bring over, open the budget here one second. 
So the full, of, it gets a little complicated with, with the appraisal, um, but the full purchase price is $372,070. And that's the value of the development rights of the conservation easement um, on the property. Three hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars. Yep. For there's no structure there; it's just land. Uh, it's eighty-eight acres, including all the farm buildings and the all the farm buildings. Farm, uh, it does. Okay. And so again, we're not. That's not to purchase that property. It's to purchase an interest in the property. Uh, right. namely the, the conservation restrictions. So I just have to understand this because I'd like to explain this in a minute. So the, the Vermont Land Trust will purchase an easement, the, the develop, development rights for $372,000, correct? Correct. And then would there be another step as well? Would, there, would that property also be sold in addition to that $372,000? Yes, yep. And so the, the conserved value of the farm is by, set by the same appraisal is two hundred and seventy-six thousand um, dollars, and so those two numbers together kind of give you the full fair market value of the farm as it is now. Two hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars, but that hasn't that that hasn't come across. That hasn't transferred yet. That's just it hasn't transferred yet. It, the plan is for a simultaneous transfer. So, at the same closing table, Sarah and Scott will sell an easement to the Vermont Land Trust and the VHCB yep. for three hundred seventy-two thousand dollars and then sell the conserved farm to Nicole Dutch, the farm buyer that we've selected at, at the appraised value of 276,000. Okay. Hi guys, I'm sorry, my internet dropped out for a couple of minutes there. I'm now on my phone. Uh, so I didn't hear the last couple of minutes of discussion. Peter, I asked, I just wanted, while you were gone, I wanted to ask with some numbers exactly what was going, how much was being spent for the easement uh, on, with the, fe the federal and state dollars. And that's, that is $372,000 on the 88 acres. And then in addition to that, there'll be a land transact, land and property transaction based on the appraised value of $276,000. Yeah. So that, that just wanted to break that down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's an illustration of, of why VLT has a farmland access program and okay. why we work on farms like this, because instead of having to come up with the 372,000 and the 276,000, Nicole, this, this farm buyer who's trying to buy her first farm only needs to finance, you know, find financing for the 276,000. I gotcha. So that's you how we make farmland more affordable. You don't know how to spell Nicole, do you? N I C O L E. Okay. And, and then her last name is Dutch, D U C H. D U C H, no T? No T. Okay. Should we make a motion so that Lee can, because Lee, you have to leave at 5 30, and there's still more you need to do? Yep, if we're, if we're ready for that, yes. Is someone willing to make a motion? I'll um, make a motion. Peter. Okay, I'll, I'll wait a minute. Can, can I, other I people weigh in well, on this? Yes. Um, Peter, this is Randy Drury. Uh, I have a question about this easement and and wondering if uh, there are any kind of um, ways to opt out in the future or any kind of timelines that lock this easement in place for. I can answer that. It, this is a perpetual easement. It quote unquote runs with the land. So it binds all future landowners. Um, there is not a mechanism to withdraw it from the land trust. This easement will be on this farm in perpetuity. As long as Thank there you. are- and I have just one other question. Um, I thought I heard you say something to the effect that there's no formal agreement for, uh, for town use in any way uh, in this deal, is that correct? Right. The, the, con the proposed conservation easement doesn't include any specific public access. Thank you. Which is typical of our farm easements, frankly, unless there's a very established public access area, um, like an existing trail or a swimming hole, uh, something like that. 
Peter, I have a question as well. Okay, um, go ahead. This land, is, this land is already in a land use program. So does anybody know what the long-term tax implications might be on this to the town? I, I can speak a little bit generally to the okay. property tax impacts. Um, so it depends on the lister at the end of the day. So this is going to be, uh, so typically I can say that uh, our, a big complaint we get from owners of conserved land is that assessed values at the town level don't decrease because of our conservation easements. Um, typically, um, there is no property tax impact, even when a property is conserved. There's a lot of nuance there. <laughs> By statute, listers are supposed to take into account any re legal restrictions on a property like an easement. Um, in practice, you most often see that listers do not decrease the assessed value of properties once an easement's in place. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, even just the personal bias of the listers. Um, in this case, it's quite complicated because Sarah and Scott are keeping a bunch of land and their house and selling a portion of it. So we won't really know, there's gonna be new tax bills issued next year, you know, one for their retained land and a new tax bill for this 88 acres. Right. Um, so, you know, I can't pretend that I know what the change in the overall assessed value of the property will be. That'll be up to the lister. But typically we don't but theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically, the, the property should be listed at fair market value. Right. Yeah. But Steve, what's the fair market value? Is it the well, that's what the listers come up with? That's what the yeah. listers come up with. So. And and again. Often we see that they listers decide that there is not a change based on our easements. Right. You know, that the property would have stayed more or less the same. There's exceptions to that for sure. But that's right. okay. typically what we see. Okay. okay, now I'm on here twice. <laughs> that doesn't sound good, Peter. <laughs> Oh, well, God. Jesus. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. I'm back. Peter, do you want me to kill kill the do the the mute your phone? Yeah, I'm gonna hold on. Yeah. Okay. I'm off the meeting on my phone. Peter, may I say something as a resident of the community? Yeah. Um, I have some serious concerns about how this will go over in a town that is suffering during COVID. We have seen people come into our office who have, who are stricken by this, who have lost their jobs, and who are very worried about making their second and third quarterly payments. I think the board should think very long and hard before giving a full $5,000 to a private transaction between for no, uh, we all can agree the intentions are awesome, but you're talking about a private transaction that benefits one person, maybe two in this town and does not benefit the community as a whole. And frankly, while that may go along with the MCC's guidelines, I'm afraid that that is not politically palatable. I think if you need public support, Sarah could give $5,000 to the conservation uh -huh. commission, and then the conservation could turn around and give $5,000 to this pro to this project. That would fulfill everybody's that would fulfill everything. Other comments? My I agree with Sarah. <laughs> this is Vic Dwyer. I agree with uh, with Sarah that uh, I had a talk with Britt earlier today and it, it will still go through. It will be still preserved. They'll just get $5,000 left. Now, I don't think that, uh, but what Sarah, some, uh, Sarah and Scott can afford it. And uh, at this time to give them flat out $5,000, I 
do not think is in the best interest of the town. And maybe uh, Brett also spoke of the easement, but that is true that the value of that farm may stay the, the same as far as the easement goes, but when Miss Dutch buys that property for 276,000, uh, it's a good argument that that's all that's worth. In other words, it would drop in, in value. So we may be talking $100,000 that the rest of us in the town of Middlesex may have to share uh, to make up for the, you know, 2,500 bucks or so in taxes. So I don't think it's a good idea. Anybody else? Um, I, I'll jump in, it's Michael Levine. Okay, Mike, go ahead. I'm afraid I came in a little late to the discussion. So I, I guess I have one question first. Is this 5,000 also guaranteeing public access to this piece of land? Is it is that public access guaranteed dependent on this $5,000? No, it's not a guarantee. It's right. not a guarantee that there would be public access either way, you think? It's... I think typical for this type of conservation easement to have that baked into the agreement. Yeah, so at, at this, the, the proposed easement does not include any specific public access provision. Okay, and that's, so it's independent of the, the $5,000 request. Okay, um, well then I think my comment may not be <clears throat> that relevant, but if this should come up again, I, I will add this two cents, that COVID has affected lots of people lots of different ways. And I appreciate Sarah and Vic's comments, but also keep in mind that as we have been trying to find more and more close by places to recreate as residents, that keeping access to land becomes actually more and more important. So. If there's a situation down the road where some public money would guarantee that, then keep that thought in mind. Okay, thank you. Can I, I mean, can I ask um, Lee a question? So, I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of seeing this from the perspective of that this is the Planning Commission's recommendation, that the Planning Commission has a budget in which they you know, make decisions around how they want to use their money. And, you know, Lee, you're supportive of this because, I mean, you've said why, that this promotes, this This is, you know, the five, that this is gonna happen no matter what, but this is sort of showing town support in promoting um, agriculture. I mean, because we have to also think about the fact that this person will have a business, right? And so this business doesn't necessarily bring in taxpayer dollar for Middlesex, but it does, you know, contribute to the greater community in terms of a business um, opening in town. Um, so I think I'd like to hear once more from Lee, if that's okay, to see, you know, what about this project has made you decide that you want to put, because I, I, I personally put more of my trust in how the Conservation Commission decides to use their money as opposed to my personal beliefs about whether or not I think this money should go to, I don't see it as going to the seedment. I don't see this as, oh, Sarah and Scott get an extra $5,000 because that's not what this is about. I think this is more about town um, support for <laughs> local agriculture. Right. Right. And as Britt alluded to earlier, it, it's um, the his programming, Vermont Land Trust, VHCB, are strengthened by leveraging the local funds and in turn can become more successful in similar efforts in other places. Um, but going back to how the Conservation Commission uh, evaluated that we have a conservation fund guidance document and the main criteria for selection. Uh, and keep in mind that you have to hit at least two of these are related to um, preservation of natural resources, scenic resources, recreational 
cultural um, resources. And then there's other criteria um, that include the fund will provide an important local matching contribution that will be used to leverage a significant amount of state, federal, or private land. Um, and also that it will help the town meet a strategic planning land use goal identified in the town plan. And those are two of the other criteria. I think um, as far as, as natural resource and scenic resource, I don't have to dive into too much detail on, on just how nice the property is and um, the aim of, you know, we've talked about preserving agricultural land and soils. Um, and then there's clearly the, the potential, no outright guarantee for recreational resources, but certainly um, more, more of a chance of, of developing some type of public access should it go into um, this type of use as opposed to um, other, other development. Thanks. Can I other comments or questions? Um, Lee, I have a question. Lee, um, you've heard uh, the comments that are against allocating the money. Um, do you think that the comments would change the opinion of the Conservation Commission um, in supporting this $5,000 allocation? I don't think so. And we've, we've talked about um, scarce funds during the time of COVID. And we've talked about um, will likely request less money for the conservation fund at the next town meeting as, as a result. Um, and, and also it's a general topic um, that's very sensitive. And I don't know if the conservation commission's the right mouthpiece for it, but there's, there's been this sense amongst our group that um, a lot of people in Middlesex are, are suffering. There's also a lot of people that are doing fine. There's a lot of us that received uh, federal stimulus checks that we didn't really need. And, and maybe um, there's a sensitive way to, to put out there to the town for people that are in that type of position to look at that long list of articles that we all discuss and debate at town meeting and, and think about which ones that you really support and if you have the means to, to support those so that it doesn't fall on the taxpayers. It's kind of a rabbit hole that just fell down there, but that's that's generally the, those are the discussions we've been having. Thank you. So the only, the only comment I have about this, and I'm really, I'm really conflicted because I hear what everybody is, everybody is saying. Um, certainly these are town funds, but this is the purpose of the conservation fund and the voters have approved putting that money in the fund in the future, they may not, but um, it isn't like this is directly coming out of our, coming out of our budget. It's coming out of a fund that we've accumulated. Now, ultimately it's taxpayer money. Believe me, I, I get that. Uh, so I don't know where that leads us, but we either need to, we either need to, uh, and I don't know if we even have the ability to do this, but, but consider this further at another meeting, because we need to, uh, we need to move on. We've got a board of civil authority meeting at six o'clock. So are people, people ready to vote? Do we want to, do we want to pass over this for tonight and think about it some more? Um, is there a, is there a timing deadline on this? Brett? Uh, not particularly. I mean, we're hoping to close by the end of the year, uh, but there are other factors there that may stretch that out. Okay, but if we if we said we would take this up again at our next meeting, that wouldn't that wouldn't foul you up too much. No, it would not. Okay. So, what's your pleasure, board members? We have a we have a motion that's been moved and seconded. Uh, we can. I believe, and help me out here, Sarah. I believe me, we can act on that motion, or we can have a. Uh, I don't. I don't think we have pass over and not consider it tonight. I, we don't think we have a motion that's been moved and seconded. No. Do we? we we don't. Oh, I, we I tried I'm to make sorry. a motion, but it didn't go through. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So I don't see the point of waiting another week. We either. I mean, unless it's something that we need to all sleep on. I personally know what how I'm going to vote, but that's 
if that if other people need time to think about it, I don't want to. I'd rather I'd rather pass over this this time. I'm I'm on the fence on this one here. Uh, there's a lot of things to consider, and I, Peter's statement that he just made makes a lot of sense. That you know the town approved the five thousand dollars for the conservation commission, and they're spending it uh, in in ways that they see fit and, and their guidelines, but I'm still on the fence on this thing. So it, I'd, I'd rather wait. So would you make a motion to pass over this for tonight? I would make a motion that we pass over this for tonight and, and uh, take it up at another select board meeting. Is there a second to that motion? Is there another motion that someone would like to make? No, I'll second it. It's fine. I'm happy to wait. Okay. Any discussion on the motion to pass over for tonight? Then we will vote. All those in favor of passing over uh, this decision until a subsequent board meeting, presumably the next board meeting, which would be in two weeks. Say aye. 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 And no. So everyone voted aye. It's unanimous. Yeah. I didn't hear everybody. Yeah. We all voted aye. Okay. All right. Okay. You didn't hear, Steve. So, so uh, I guess we're uh, we're passing over this for tonight, uh, Britt and Lee. And uh, I don't know that you need to be here for the next meeting, but it would be good, Lee, if you could be. I'm sorry to keep. <laughs> bringing you into this, but you're our man on this uh, on this subject. So if it's possible, if you could uh, zoom in to our next meeting, that would be great. Yeah, I should be able to. Okay, thank you very much. No, yeah. I'll take point if that's okay too. Sure. Okay, yep. Thank you. Great. Thank um, you. The next item on the agenda, and we are now uh, woefully behind, so we need to uh, be brief if we can be is uh, Lee Rosberg to discuss the Conservation Commission's intention to seek cost estimates from Thank consulting you. foresters to develop a detailed forest management plan. And I presume this is the town forest, Lee? He's good. Oh. Okay, good. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta take off. I've got about two minutes, but... Um, okay, well, give it to us, give it to us quick. Here's, here's the quick. Um, so we had, Ethan Tapper, who's the Chittenden County Forester, come out and evaluate whether or not there could be some timber harvest on the on the property in concert with a neighboring landowner. Um, he took a look at what we have in our town forest management plan um, as as a forest management plan and recommended that we seek out a consulting forester to to really. Um, draft the detailed plan that can be used um, to guide any future timber harvests. So we wanted to just bring that in front of the board and um, let you know our intent and see if you had any concerns over that. So you have money in your budget to do that? There's no, at this point, it would just be seeking bids to find out what that would cost. Okay, but where would you expect the money to come from if it went forward? Is there money in your budget to do this or are we looking for the town to pay for this directly? It depends on how much it costs. There's there's some I guess money. we're gonna have a chance, you're, you're gonna seek bids and then we're gonna have a chance to discuss this. Right. So you're basically just giving us a heads up that you're, uh, you're seeking bids and we're gonna discuss this at some time in the future. Right. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, the whole idea of of logging in the town forest was to create revenue. So hopefully, it would be exactly a net uh, a net gain, not a loss. And certainly, you know, that's what that's part of what we expected to do with the town forest. No, that's that's where we want to go with it. We want to generate revenue and um, stop asking the taxpayers for money. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for hanging around till the last minute. Does anybody have any quick questions or? Oh. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night.
Okay. Liz, it's time to fire up the wood stove. I bought an electric blanket. It works really well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you need Sarah, to was, Sarah, I was thinking about going down for a swim. I don't know. You make me cold just looking at you. Okay, so moving moving right along, clarifying certain parts of town personnel policy action likely. Is that you, Sarah, or Dorinda? It, it's both of us, but can we skip over this? Because I think we're running out of time. Okay, it's not urgent, in other words. Right. Okay, a uh, quick highway report, Steve. Okay, quick highway, <clears throat> highway report. Um, we're finishing up at the town pit, putting in some posts and gates uh, so that we can close the pit off for uh, vehicular traffic and we've completed the little parking area that would be for the town forest and over the next couple of weeks we're going to be doing some maintenance on the road stuff but uh, first and foremost we will be making sure that all of our winter uh, equipment is ready to ready to go and that will pretty much cover it okay and no uh no updates on candidates for our road foreman position. No, none. So are we working on a plan of how we're going to go forward on the after the 16th? I presume we are. Well, we're going to be limping along with three people. <laughs> that's the plan. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> Well, that's not necessarily the plan, but I mean, we'll be looking for people that, that could come in and help out, maybe just plowing. Uh, there's, uh, I've been putting some feelers out there and let's see what we get for a response over the next couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, I think that would be the, uh, that would be what I would be looking for is to find somebody, maybe a retired person who has experience, still has a CDL, uh, well, there, there's some construction workers that get laid off in the winter months too. So yep. to be able to come in there. Cause it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a problem if we try and limp by with just three guys. I mean, well, uh, we're going to limp by for a little bit with three guys, but yeah. no, no, no. I yep. understand. I understand. Okay. Hey, Peter, I just want to say that I have been putting, I did talk to Berlin today and the Tom Peter, I mean, Steve probably knows him. Tom Podesky, is, does that sound familiar? He's going to call me back because Berlin just uh, interviewed a whole bunch of candidates for a road foreman, and he's going to go look through his files and see if there might be any of the um, also ran, so runners up who might be interested coming to Middlesex. Thanks, Sarah. That's I, great. I hate, to say, I hate to say we'll take anything we can get, but I would say we'll take anything good we can get. How about that? <laughs> Well, or we can say we'll talk to as many of them as we need to. We'll talk to as many of them that'll come forward. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone has to call me back. So, but okay, it's, a great well, it's, it's interesting to know that they received a bunch of resumes. I mean, that's that's at least encouraging. I think there are people out there who are looking. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dorinda, treasurer's report. Hey, Peter. Before you move on from the road uh road report i have a this is randy i'm sorry okay. um i was just wondering if we might be able to get an update on uh what what the plan is or if it's been dropped as far as uh during the town meeting we had a pretty uh lengthy conversation about uh the forty thousand dollars that was additional money that was allocated to hiring on a person to run an excavator for a month and rent an excavator. I'm wondering if we can get an update on that. Steve? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not, we're not doing that. So that money won't be used. So what will happen with that money? It's, it's part of the overall budget. It's part of the overall budget, but I feel like that was, if, if the money is What's that, the Peter? Money is, Randy, just let me speak for a minute. If, if the money ultimately isn't spent, it goes into the town fund balance. Um, but I think the plan is to spend the money, Steve, right? It just isn't to spend it in that way. If we can spend it in that way, yes. Okay. So I have a, I have a follow-up question to that. With that money not being used, the 
the plan, part of the plan, if I recall, was that uh, during the time when this person would be doing ditch work, um, which it looks like most likely the town crew probably did themselves, that the town crew would be able to do other things and stay on point with their with their uh, maintenance plan for the year. What do what do we have to say about uh, what was overlooked during that period of time that didn't get done? <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't have, I don't have a lengthy report right here in front of me to give you on that, Randy, but I will say that because of the sentiment of everybody, uh, what they wanted us to do, they wanted to see our road crew doing ditching and stuff. And so that's what we did. And we didn't get into some of the other maintenance items. We did as much as we could. Um, I can get with you at some point and go over point by point but I'm not gonna get into that entire discussion tonight. That, that'd be great. I think uh, just given the length of discussion at town meeting, I, I think that it would, be, it would be nice to have an idea of, of the implications of not doing that. So if you have time at some point, I would, I would love to, to hear that. That's not a problem. I will give you a call and we can set it up. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anything else on uh, roads? Okay, Dorinda. Um, I sent you guys uh, the renewal application for um, passive, and I just wondered- Insurance, insurance, insurance. Insurance, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if you've looked it over, you're all set with the values that is on the- um, that they have for our buildings and are you all set with going forward with the way they um, value the property, the different options? So uh, number one, uh, I did look it over in some detail. I think the building values to me looked fine. Um, they, are, they are built in the policy. There's a guaranteed replacement cost provision. So by accepting their values, they're tacitly agreeing to pay the replacement value uh, of those buildings if something happens. But the values looked okay to me. I thought some of the contents values looked a little skinny and I don't have them out in front of me, but I think we only had $46,000 on the contents of the town garage. And that doesn't sound like very much. Now that doesn't include the, the trucks or equipment, but it includes all of, it does include equipment, it includes all the tools and miscellaneous equipment, which are in there, computers, whatever, whatever else. I just, I have no sense of whether, whether that's a good number or not. Either I have it and I'm, I'm just looking at, at, I'm looking at the contents value and I'm, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing what, what you're, which one you're talking about. I'm talking about the town garage. Well, I'm talking about all the buildings. I mean, the town clerk's office doesn't have a very high value on it either. I mean, like, for example, the new fire station only has $125,000 for contents. That's pretty low. Well, and that's a lot more than 46 or whatever. <laughs> down the road. I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know what the process should be on that, but I'm concerned about those values. And I think they've been the same for a while. I mean, we radically over the past few years, they've pushed us to um update and upgrade and increase the values on the buildings but they never make any recommendation about the contents and i don't know how we how, to, how yeah. we deal with that i mean i guess ultimately what we do is we ask the town clerk to do have somebody do a replacement cost survey on the contents of the uh of the town hall we have the fire department do the same thing and we have the highway department do the same thing we can we can always endorse we can renew the policy as it is and endorse the policy to increase those limits at any time. So it's not like it's not like we're making the decision forever by by giving them the okay to renew the policy the way it is. Okay. But, the, it says on the cover that they increased it 2.2 percent. Right. I think that's only the building the, value, though. Uh, it says property values, so I don't know if that means. Yeah, typically, and I'm know. I'm not sure of that, Dorinda, but typically that's only the buildings. Okay, uh, and, and it's all should be at replacement cost value, correct? 
Yes. Guaranteed complete. Yep. Guaranteed replacement cost. Okay. Yes, correct. Okay. Because I think something came up on one of our claims that we weren't in at some at that or something, but I'll double check on that if that's what you're going for. Okay. Um, and no, if, they, if they don't feel that those values support that guaranteed replacement cost, then they need to tell us. Okay. Well, what are you recommending that we uh, we start doing a survey on our fire department town hall and town garage to come up with a realist, more realistic value of the content? We need, we need to do something and I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, I can go around and look at the stuff, but I'm not a good judge of what it is. And again, remember, you know, the 25 year old socket wrench set that we paid $4.50 for 20 years ago is now probably $75. It's a replacement value, not the depreciated value of the, of the tools and the equipment. Right. So it comes up to a pretty good number. I'm sure Steve would, uh, would agree with that. Yeah, I do. And for the record, I sent the list of vehicles to both the highway and the fire department to have them just say, yep, those are the vehicles we have. I heard back from Paul right away. I have still not heard back from the fire department. <laughs> I didn't see a list of vehicles. I didn't send it to you guys because you wouldn't know if they existed or not. So I just <laughs> sent it on to them. Wait a the truth the truth really hurts <laughs> i mean well, I, I figured well, you it can't, was... dorinda if you can't get a response from them let me know and i'll i'll bug them i mean i'm you know well, they want us to pay to... for all this stuff and they don't make the slightest effort to support it and make sure it's correct it's well it has to be in by friday so i'm going to submit it as is and you well, know we can, always, and... we can always endorse it but i want them to tell us Regardless yep. of what the insurance policy says, what the vehicles are. I just figured I'd mention it for the record. You just wanted to raise my blood pressure, didn't you? Nope. <laughs> okay. So you won't need that gin and tonic. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So I, I guess what we need to do is, uh, I mean, this is an awful thing to ask Paul in the in the last few days, but maybe. Maybe Steve, you and I can walk around there and kind of look at the stuff and, and see what we think. I don't know, some I, kind I, of process. And certainly I, the fire department needs to tell yeah. us. I, I think that uh, between Paul and I, we can come up with a list so that we can kind of get a general idea of what a replacement cost would be. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I just, don't want, I just don't want something to happen. We pay a lot for this insurance. We want it to do what it needs to do if heaven forbid we have a loss. Okay. Anything else, uh, Dorinda? No. Dorinda, I had one question. Like, are we really paying $47,000 and some pennies for the principal and interest on the fire station in one check? Yep. You bet we are. Okay, that's a lot of money. And it's going to be going that on for quite a while longer. Yep, that's just our bond payment. And I almost think we pay that twice a year, maybe. I have to go back and look, but it's a substantial amount. Wow. So how many more years do you think we have on that? Um, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. I think it's, what, it's 20 a, years? 20 years? It's in our uh, town report every year what's left on it, I believe, yeah. when it expires. It's got a good run to go, Mary. I can tell you that. Oh, no, I know. I was hoping it was like, you know, maybe it was one of those things we hadn't looked at for a while. So maybe it was, it dropped precipitously. We just didn't notice. <laughs> it raises my blood pressure every time we look at the, look at the budget. And I'm not saying I don't like that building. I do, but, you know, was that our highest and best priority at the time? We all supported it at the time, I believe. Anyway. So we've got people from the uh, PCA joining in. If you guys just want to swing through the rest of this agenda, we can be done. Move approval of all the minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of approving those three sets of minutes, please say aye. 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 Any against? Any opposed? Okay, we've approved them. Um, Liz, I'm sorry to do this to you, but can we defer your 
discussion of that of that survey. I I studied over the survey. I thought it was very interesting. I did, and I hope everybody else will look over the survey. The the Thank only you. thing that really really jumped out to me more than anything else that I didn't expect too much was the uh, lack of support for the uh, walkable Middlesex business. But we'll we'll have well a that's the fact that sixty nine percent of the people said that it, while they're really really interested in all these things. They didn't want to serve on any committees. Yeah, well, that's we got a lot of people actually. We got like fifteen people interested in the serve in in the I committee. I know, but I mean, seventy percent said no. Well, Not I really. wouldn't either. Stuff, but I don't want to serve. Well, that doesn't, su Mary. That doesn't surprise you, based upon our uh, our collective experience over all these years, does it? Well, anyway. I guess it did i thought it was I, I thought it was i thought it was interesting i thought it was a good survey and i think it's going to be uh i think it's going to be helpful for all of us to look that over and think about it no but i, I anyway. didn't over it it was i just i guess when you put a number on it the number of people who don't want to help but want to be in, involved it was just surprising but you know all i know I, all there's only 10 percent of the population that answered yeah yeah i know Okay, so anything else for the select board this evening? Any correspondence, Sarah? No. Okay, so I'm going to adjourn the select board meeting only three minutes late. Do you think I have uh, to, I, I, just for a Zoom point of view, should I like stop this meeting and start the Zoom meeting or will it be the same thing? I don't know how these work. I don't know for sure either, you know, people, Zoom into the BCA meeting. Do they get connected to this, or is it a separate hey, Theo. thing? Is Theo, is Theo's not there. If he's there, he could answer this question. Theo, Theo is yeah. there. How'd, um, you, how'd you get into this meeting, Theo? <laughs> I use your login ID. Okay. I, I just think, don't know if other people are not going to do that or not. Well, it isn't isn't that Zoom meeting ID your your ongoing meeting ID? So whether yeah. it says BCA or Select Board, it's the same thing. Right. I think it is. All right. I think it's the same. Are we supposed to same. get off though? No. I'm looking at it. It's actually the same. Okay. Yeah, I think they are. I'm pretty sure they are. Okay. So then we go. To you the send us the minutes for the. Um, I mean, did you send us the agenda for the BCA? I did. I kind of okay. forgot about it. I think, it's, I think it's accidentally, I accidentally dated it October 1st. That's not what I put up on the website, but when I sent it to you, so I sent it on Thursday, along with the policy. Did you get that email along with the, pol the, the yeah. COVID policy, the Middlesex COVID election day? Yeah, policy? I remember getting the. I remember getting the email. I just kind of forgot. So I just need to find the agenda for the um, BCA. Okay, I'm just going to send it to you again. Right? Can I send it right now, Liz? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Okay. The ice in my drink is melting. Too bad, Peter. All right. I'll recover. What have you got in that cup, Mary? Ice. Vodka and ice? No, ice. <laughs> Nothing else but ice. <laughs> I drank the gin and tonic already. All right, Liz, I sent it to you. Okay. Oh, is um, Cleo the only person who's joined us? Yep. Only non yes yeah, select board member. I know Chris was supposed to be here. We talked about it, but I don't, he's always late. So I haven't gotten it yet. I don't know. I don't have to tell you, Liz. I so you it. said you sent it. You sent the other one on the sixth. I sent the other one on the first, and I just yeah, it was five days ago. I sent the, you sent it on Thursday. The uh, yeah, the first. Wait, hold on. Yeah, I sent it to you. Here, let me just do it. One oh, I see it. I have it. BCA agenda. I got it. Are we, are we, did we, are we calling it to order? Should I call it to order or are we waiting? That would be up to you, Madam Chairman. I mean, you're done. I mean, did, did we close off we the other meeting? You're the okay. select board meeting, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Okay, so it's 6.05, I'm sorry, 6.06 and we're calling the Board of Civil Authority meeting to order. Um, looks like we have the same guests that are still on, Orca and Paul and Dorinda. Um, okay, so 
We're going to prepare for November 3rd, 2020 general election, um, designating the following to act as election officials for the general election. David Smith, assistant clerk, Dorinda Crowell, treasurer, former assistant clerk, Marika Gillis, moderator, Susan Clark, and Betsy Davis. Hey, listen, likely. Can I okay, amend that to also include Jane Tucker, who's our longtime ballot clerk? She told me on Sunday she would like to uh, she would like to volunteer. Yes, and then Jane Tucker. Right. Um, is there any discussion? Move approval. Yeah. Okay. Any second? second? Okay. Second. So all those in favor of designating those folks that I just mentioned, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. The ayes have it. So next, we're going to appoint two JPs to deliver ballots to housebound voters on election day. Um, action likely. Um, is there a, a thought of who those two JPs might be? I'll, I'll volunteer Charlie because he's okay. And, I'll and, do it also. and Peter. So Charlie and Peter. Okay. Any motion or dis any discussion on that? Okay. I'll motion. second. I'll second Steve's motion. Then we have discussion. Okay, so do you want to discuss? <laughs> no. Then you move the vote. <laughs> okay, all those in favor of um, of um, Peter Hood and Charlie Merriman as the justices of the pieces who will deliver ballots to housebound voters, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, the ayes have it. All right, appointing a schedule of justice of pieces to be on call via Zoom should an emergency end our voting. Is it the justices or the BCAs? Yeah, it should be it should be the BCA. You're right. So okay. sorry about that. Um, also, Chris said that he's cleared his schedule out for all of uh, is all of November 3rd. So I know he'll be able to be available. Um, my the, I just want to tell you very briefly what we're, we're going to have to do is uh, Dorinda actually helped work on this. We're going to uh, have voting in town hall. We're going to have three booths, not two booths set up. We're going to have a waiting space for maybe two for two people, no more. That's going to be enough complete because we're going to have people inside working too. And um, we're going to get a deli uh, counter so that people can remove their uh, remove a ticket if this is packed and they can be called in based on their number from their cars where they hopefully will be keeping warm. And I'm probably gonna station either Chris or Charlie and maybe someone else if they want to at the bottom of the stairs under a tent. So if anybody has like one of those little tents that like U32 does for running, do you know what I'm talking about? Pop-ups. Mm -hmm. Pop-up tent, we need something like that so that we're gonna keep the ballot, we're gonna keep the absentee ballot box down there. That way people don't have to come up the stairs and get in the traffic. We're just gonna put them right down at the bottom of the stairs. People deposit their ballot ballot after saying, you know, after verifying their names off the checklist and also verifying that the signature envelopes are signed. So that way we're going to minimize traffic going in and out of town hall because I have the feeling we're going to have a lot of absentee ballots returned that way. So um, someone will be outside doing that? that? Yeah, someone's going to be outside doing that. So I'm going to put, i definitely going to use Charlie because he did, he did that for uh, the primary. And he was, and he, so he knows the drill. And I'm probably going to use Chris since he said he's going to schedule uh, all day. But it would probably be good to have someone else as backup who sits there in the cold outside, under a tent. And also, do you, any of you guys have those tents? I have a pop. I have a pop up that I could. Oh, someone else has one. I have a four posted pop up thing that I could give to you to use. Oh, just for a minute. Does someone else have one? Or? I have one too, Theo. So whatever's easier. Okay. Well, no, I mean. In case someone didn't. Uh, does anyone, Has anyone gotten their ballot yet? I haven't gotten mine yet. I, I got did. mine. I don't know, Mary. I, it's, that's all I've been doing for the past 24 hours is answering these calls and sending ballots that were missent. It's just, okay. it's just a whole cluster. So everyone is saying they got it except for me? Nope. There are plenty of people who haven't gotten their ballots, partially because the Secretary of State's office decided to erase the 05682 uh, zip codes off of Middlesex ballots, and I've had to remail those to 05602. So this has really been, this has been a bit of a trial. I'm, I'm a past the breaking point, to be quite honest. Oh, Sarah. It's awful. It's just awful. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't let up. Um, so anyway, like, can I have one more person working on that, uh, volunteering besides those two that we just, who are I not? Will. Mary, you have to sit outside. Oh, 
people. Okay, I was going to volunteer to be the Zoom person with questions. I, I can do do outside. Okay, Liz, would you? Is there a better time during the day for you, like morning? I'd rather do the morning. I have an um, afternoon meeting, but okay. So, Liz, why don't we just put you down for the morning for that? Thank okay. you. Like Where, what time? Seven a.m. Yep. Maybe bring bring a salamander or something. Bring your electric blanket. We'll my electric blanket with a with a um, extension cord. <laughs> we'll just run it right through the town clerk's office. Liz, I think I'll bring you, Liz. I'll bring you my motorcycle jacket. You can hook it up to your car with jumper cables. It's toasty warm. Ooh, that's a good idea. So we've got Liz, Theo. I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry, not Theo. Liz, Charlie, and Chris. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so now we're but now we are appointing the schedule of of BCAs to be on call via Zoom should an emergency and or voting question arise during election day action likely. Is well, there a we motion? Have, if we have those three people there, that's enough to do a um that's that's enough for because it's with me. So I will have we'll have two people. That's good. So we don't need that. I think if we can just do, if we have the three who are outside, if Mary wants okay. to call in, Mary, are you, is there a time when you can be on call more than others during the uh, November 3rd? Anytime. Just seven, tell me. We call you at 7.05. You can do that in the morning. Oh, that's not the best time for me. <laughs> because I'm on the BCA, so you don't need that. You need right. her in the afternoon. Okay, so we'll do we'll do we'll do her the B. Yeah, well, we, uh, JPs are also on the BCA, so sure, I'm happy to I'm happy to be on that list, and I'm up early in the morning. That's not okay. A so we'll do Peter as a backup in, in the in the morning, and we'll do Mary on the afternoon, and just in case okay. uh, afternoon, like noon to seven. Yep. Okay. Okay. So do, is there a motion for that? Do we have to move that? I'll move it. Okay. I'll second. All right, I move that uh, uh, Liz, I'll move that Liz, Charlie, and Chris work outside and be on backup for any disputes regarding any any collection questions, and that by Zoom, Mary is available from um, Peter is available from seven a.m. to noon, and Mary is available from noon to seven, just in the case we need more backup. Right. right. Okay. Any uh, further Peter, discussion on that? Uh, Peter, Peter. Start down and start up the tabulator with you. No. And Peter, you can bring your pop, bring your pop up, and if you somehow don't have it or need it, just call me and I'll bring mine. Okay. Okay. Would you would you send me an email and remind me to do that, Sarah? Please. I will. And also, if you want to open up the tabulator at six four six thirty, you may. Well, I'm happy to do it if you need somebody to do it. That's all I'm well, saying. Actually, I don't think we're going to do it because we're just we're going to actually run the ballots on Monday. So all we're going to do is turn it off. So we're not going to print. We're going to turn it off and turn okay. it on. We're all not right. printing okay. out anything. Okay. Fine. You want to come down on Monday beforehand and do that. You can do that at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sarah, if you need me to do it, I'll do it. If you don't need me to do it, I won't do it. Okay. So send Go me an email. Tell me what you need. I'll be around. All right. Okay. So is there any further discussion? Okay. So all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The ayes have it. Um, now we're going to review and approve um, a list of voters who have registered since the last BCA review on July 27, 2020. Action likely. Move approval. I'll okay. second. Any discussion? Okay. So all those in favor of moving um, the list of um, new voters um, or the new checklist, say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. And opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Um, reviewing and approving a Middlesex COVID-19 election day policy. Hmm, action likely. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Is there a second? I'll second that, yes. Okay, is there a discussion? What is this COVID-19 election day policy? Is that something you wrote up, Sarah, that I didn't, didn't actually read? Yes, yes and she did okay. a good job on it. It's something that we can, as as we all have learned, it's better to be able to hand people policies in case they, uh, in case we have problems. And we do, yeah. we do anticipate a few problems. Um, we just people need to wear masks. They can't wear guns, and we can't right, yeah. we can't okay. harass voters. And that they've got to be really clear on that. And okay. uh, 
that's where you're going to come in, Liz, while you're sitting out there in the cold in the morning in case anybody acts up. Well, I'll bring her a gun and my motorcycle jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting better and better. I thought you did a real good job with it. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so any other discussion? All righty. All those in favor of the Middlesex COVID-19 Election Day policy, um, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the ayes have it. And we are adjourning at 617. Yay.